Okay, let's wrap this one up. So, when we talk about optical interference, you might as well touch on a couple topics which are going to take us beyond just visible light. And the first one is Bragg reflection, but particularly used for X-ray analysis of materials such as crystallinity of semiconductors. And so, the first question is: This is a this is an X-ray machine that looks at crystallinities of semiconductors shown here. Why do they use X-rays? Let's think about that for a sec. Well, if you're going to measure interference of something which has really small spacings, such as the spacing between atoms, to figure out crystallinity, then you better use really short wavelengths. And X-rays have very short wavelengths, right? You couldn't do this with visible light because it would the, the periodicity would not be comparable to a wavelength of light. Remember, when we made a photonic crystal or those quarter wavelength stacks, it was a fraction of the wavelength of light, right? And so again, if you're looking at atomic spacings, the periodicity at which you could get scattering of light off the different atoms here and the layers of atoms, you need a really short wavelength. You need x-rays. And so we had talked about this before. If I have sheets of atoms here and I want to figure out the spacing between them, I can use Bragg reflection, also called Bragg diffraction, using that same equation for interference where it's dependent on the spacing between x-rays which come in here and come off this layer versus the next layer, and then you can get the atomic spacing between these layers of, of atoms. So if you do this, here's a intensity, reflected intensity spectra for a couple different materials, A, B, and C, versus units of degrees. Okay? And so what they do is they actually you put your sample in the system and you rotate it back and forth through these degrees. And you'll see you get these intensities start to spike up at different peaks. And you could think of this in, in several ways. It's more complicated, but you could see this that I have a, you know, here's a layer here, and if I rotated it, I could start to see layers this way as well, right? And so as you start to rotate this through different angles, you'll start to see peaks appear, and that'll tell you things like the spacing between layers, the chemical bonding, and tell you how crystalline it is. If it's very amorphous, you won't get a nice, precise reflection peaks. They'll be broad and, and shallow. And so this is a great tool used for materials characterization. And I want you to remember, again, that everything we're doing in this course applies to wavelengths beyond visible. They're all electromagnetic waves. Okay? And so we're right here in the visible spectrum, but you can go all the way out here to short wavelengths, all the way out through very long wavelengths, which gets you into electronics such as microwave and, and, and radio waves. And the key point is that what we learned for visible applies to short wavelengths, like we talked about for characterizing uh, materials, and to longer wavelengths. So here's a great analogy for you. We've been talking about how you can basically reduce reflection from optical surfaces, right, using interference, or increase reflection. Well, you should remember when you took signals and systems or... My, or electromagnetic fields, when you had a basic transmission line, you had to tune these different parameters to get maximum transmission through the transmission line or maximum reflection, right? And it's the exact same principles. You can treat all of these systems the same as impedance matching um, that you would have in an electrical system. And so I just want you to show you the analogies. The type of tools you use might vary, and the materials vary, but the net, the same thing you're trying to achieve is consistent across all of these where you're interfering or destructively or constructively interfering some sort of uh, sinusoid or other type of uh, time varying waveform. And you know, what you could do with this, it's, it's pretty powerful. You can steer actually electromagnetic radiation using interference principles. So Here's the question. If I can use interference forces to cause radiation to go from destructive interference to locations where it is constructive interference, could I then emit the radiation from a bunch of point sources with different phases, interfere them to control the direction of propagation? Well, the answer is yes, and this is used all the time in phased array approaches for microwaves. So they call it a phased array because you've got an array. It could be 2D or 1D as shown here. Okay. And the phases shift for all these different antennas. So here's your antenna input. So you put your signal here that you want to broadcast. And then it's split out to each of these units, which are just phase shifters. They just take that input and they delay it. Okay, so here's no delay. 
this came out first, and then as you go in this direction, these come out later and later. Well, if you look at the antenna signal that comes out, here's the signal that came from this one, here's the signal that came from um, this one, and you can see this came out first, so it's out here. As you delay these and let these come out even later and later, and you look at where their wave fronts overlap constructively, it's right here, which means that this thing would, would propagate in this direction. If you wanted to steer this transmission in this direction, all you do is you change the phase shift, and you could have it go in this direction as well. So it's a really powerful way to electronically steer radiation without having to do any mechanical tilting or rotating. Imagine, this could happen really fast. You could steer this thing instantly with electronics, not have to rely on some kind of mechanical, bulky mechanical system to do that. And again, waves are waves. So you can even do this with ultrasound. This is not radiation, but they're still waves. And so this system here is a diagram of a system like that used to explode kidney stones inside your body. So if you get kidney stones, they want to break them up into smaller pieces so that you can pass them from your body. But how are you going to do this? Well, they don't want to do surgery, so what they'll do is that if here's the body, they'll have all these ultrasound emitters here with different phases. They'll get the same thing, interference here, and they'll get it such that the phase front focuses down right to where that kidney stone is inside your kidney. <coughs> and as a result, you basically hit that kidney stone with a ultra-powerful sound wave just where the stone is. And out here where the waves are spread out, there's no d damage to your tissue in your body. And so you could focus it down and basically create an explosion somewhere inside the body to blow up a kidney stone. So this is another great example of using interference, not with radiation, but with sound waves. And more about ph phased arrays, you can do this optically. One of the best ways to do this with optics is to use liquid crystals. Liquid crystals can create phase delays. We'll talk more about that later in this, in, this, uh, in this course. And you can do things to steer like this green laser to different points, as you can see in the background here. This is one of the first phased arrays ever created. This was done by Germany in World War II. Why is it so huge? Well, back then, again, think of the electronics you had available. And so you went to really long wavelengths, really low frequencies, because you could actually control it. Um, you wouldn't make really small phased arrays. You just didn't have the high frequency electronics to generate the signals and control it. And this is a modern U.S. Air Force Space Command radar system. Basically, this is a big antenna, and it can steer the radiation in any direction it wants out using a phased array approach. And so they have these things sitting in different locations, and you can see the large region it can cover. The advantage is as follows. One, if I wanted to be scanning out here and then instantly scan to here with this radar, if I do that mechanically, it would take me time to go back and forth, right? Well, this one is just uses electronics and interference, so it goes instantly back and forth. Furthermore, think about the precision. How, you know, you're hundreds and thousands of miles pointing something out here and trying to be precise. Tough to do mechanically, but if I use interference, then I can probably control this very well with high-performance electronics in terms of where I want to steer it to in the far field. The other thing you want to look at here is look how big this is. There's a Jeep there, okay, or a crane. This thing's huge. Why is this so huge? Well, think of last week's lab. The reason why this is so huge, one reason is, is that when you have a larger beam, it has less divergence. If I'm going hundreds or thousands of miles, I don't want my beam to diverge too much. And so if I make a really large emitter and beam here, then by the time it gets way far out here, you'll have much less divergence than you otherwise would. Okay, at this point, we're done with, uh, with this first part of uh, interference. We'll touch on it next week with diffraction. Make sure you can answer this review question, which is related a little bit to the uh, previous lecture with thin film coatings, but I wanted you to have you think about it a little bit more, and one that's a little bit more related to what we just talked about here.